Hi everyone, my name is Susie Redden smith I'm the Clinic Coordinator at the University of London's Refugee Law Clinic and very happy to be chairing the panel today, um, which is panel 4B on asylum determination and adjudication in the UK. So just firstly, as a short bit of housekeeping, we have four presentations today. So each presenter will talk for around 15 minutes and we'll have time for a Q&A session at the end. So onto the session itself, um, we've got a really interesting range of presentations on, on different aspects of asylum determination and adjudication. The panel explores the experiences and interactions that asylum seekers have both with the Home Office and with courts in a number of different ways. Drawing together insights both from how the Home Office and justice, justice system frame asylum seekers to research that seeks to understand the organizational culture and the experience of the asylum seekers themselves in these spaces. Um, so I'm really looking forward to learning more about each of the panelists research and firstly I will welcome Dr John Campbell. Um, who will be presenting on legal legal silos and indifference the wrongful prosecution of refugees and asylum seekers in the UK. Um, just to introduce him a little bit, Dr. John Campbell is a social anthropologist who undertook his doctoral research in West Africa before teaching urban sociology at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania in the early 1980s. Subsequently, he has taught at Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland, at the University of Swansea in Wales, and at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, in London, from where he retired in 2018. He has written two monographs about refugees and asylum and a third about the quality of justice in London's magist magistrates courts. And John has published widely and has also worked as a consultant in international development. So I will hand over to Dr. John Campbell. Thank you very much. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Susan. Um, uh, this paper explores what I consider an unsavory chapter in the United Kingdom's treatment of refugees. <clears throat> namely its systematic violation of Article 31.1 of the 1951 Refugee Convention, which was enacted to exempt refugees who were, quote unquote, coming directly from a country of persecution from being punished on account of their, quote unquote, illegal entry or presence in a host country. Such persons should not be persecuted provided that they, prevent, that they present themselves without delay to the authorities and show, and show good cause for their illegal entry or presence. Now, these are uh, phrases strictly out of Article 31.1. While the UK is certainly not the only signatory of the Refugee Convention, which systematically violates Article 31.1, it has led the way by its, <clears throat> by its adoption, <clears throat> excuse me, of numerous measures and laws aimed explicitly at criminalizing and demonizing asylum seekers and refugees and its willingness to flout the Refugee Convention. I begin by briefly setting out the international uh, context uh, in, in which the refugee of the con Convention. The full paper examines how the UK has prevented the entry into the country of illegal immigrants and refugees by adopting legislation that has imposed criminal sanctions on carriers and the creation of visa regimes for nearly all refugee producing countries. These penalties have been maintained over the years and have been buttressed by additional legislation which has criminalized asylum seekers fleeing persecution who attempt to enter the country without a valid passport or entry visa. This paper explores the nexus between criminal law, asylum law, and international law to explain why these wrongful persecutions, prosecutions continue. The refugee, contention, the refugee Convention stipulates that a state should not expel or return refugees i.e. Article 33 regarding non refoulement and that as far as possible states should facilitate the assimilation and naturalization of refugees, Article 34 of the Convention. In addition, Article 31, which concerns refugees unlawfully in the country of refuge, states that, quote, contracting states should not impose penalties on account of their illegal presence on refugees who coming directly from a territory where their life or freedom was threatened in the sense of Article 1 of the Convention, enter or are present in their territory without authorization, provided they present themselves without delay to the authorities and show good cause for their illegal entry or presence. I now turn to the situation in the United Kingdom. Academic work on the travel preparatory of, of Article 31 concluded that the parties who, who drafted it were clear 
that refugees should not be penalized for seeking asylum. However, the task of defining who is a legitimate refugee was left to national refugee determination systems. And each system, each country has adopted a somewhat conflicting approach. Disagreements have arisen regarding the interpretation of the phrase that refugees are required, in quote, to come directly to a host state and claim asylum, and the meaning of the phrase present themselves to the authorities without delay. And this is where the key problems lie in the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, Article 31 has failed to provide asylum seekers with either a defense or a bar against prosecution. In the 1990s, Hale, who was a probation officer, was the first to observe that refugees entering the UK with a false passport were detained on arrival while decision was made by an immigration officer as to whether to allow them temporary uh, admission into the UK. She noted that while these individuals were not prosecuted, many were returned to their country from which they had departed if the decision was not to allow them to enter the country. However, individuals transiting the United Kingdom with a, without a valid passport were prosecuted for a criminal offense. In the late 1990s, Richard Dunstan noted that the sudden rise in prosecution against refugees which appears to have been triggered by the adoption of carrier sanctions and visa restrictions in the mid 90s by UK legislation. Dunstan estimated that between 1993 and 1996, approximately 550 arrests were made at Heathrow Airport. He noted that those attempting to flee uh, persecution are often unable to obtain national passports and are in any case, most unlikely to be able to obtain a valid visa for their destination countries given the imposition of visa restrictions. The resulting situation, he argued, was that the United Kingdom was in breach of Article 31. And this paper argues that the situation has worsened in subsequent years. In 1999, the appeals of four asylum seekers who had been prosecuted and convicted for entering the UK illegally reached the High Court in England. The case was ex parte Adimi. The court considered the meaning of Article 31.1 in the light of the fact that, and this is the, the court of Lord Justice, no arm of the state, neither the Secretary of State, the DPP, the, the Criminal Prosecution Authority, nor anyone else had apparently given the least thought to the UK, UK's obligations arising under Article 31. The High Court thought that, quote, immunity from prosecutions should surely apply even where asylum is refused, unquote. Lord Justice Brown argued that it was preferable for Article 31 protection to operate by way of a defense where it is, in, where it is invoked, the burden should be on the prosecution to disprove it. However, as I will show in this paper, this has not taken place. While the court refrained from declaring that the convictions of, against the appellants were invalid, it asked that a valid defense against such prosecutions should be created. Shortly afterwards, a so-called statutory defense was created in the form of Section 31 of the Immigration Asylum Act of 1999. Section 31 reads in part, it is a defense for a refugee charged with an offense to which this section applies to show that having come to the UK directly from a country where his life or freedom was threatened, he presented himself to the authorities in the United Kingdom without delay showed good cause for his illegal entry or presence, and made a claim for asylum as soon as was reasonably practical after his arrival in the United Kingdom. However, whereas new legislation provisions penalize illegal entry, a statutory defense did not materialize until the Asylum and Immigration Treatment of Claimants Act 2004 was passed into law. Section 2.4 of that act states, entering the United Kingdom without a passport, etc., established a limited basis for a reasonable excuse defense against prosecution. Unfortunately, the act also created numerous new criminal defenses relating to illegal entry, and it did not stop any of the British authorities, the police, the Home Office, the border forces from prosecuting and convicting asylum seekers for illegal entry. The overall effect of legislation criminalizing illegal entry into the UK has resulted in a substantial increase in prosecutions. For example, FOI data um, obtained from the Criminal Prosecution Service indicates that the number of people who are prosecuted for entering the UK on a false passport between 2009 and 2012 
was well over 19,000 individuals. The Crown Prosecution Service did not provide information about the outcome of the prosecutions. This data revealed that between 2009 and 2013, four different legislative acts were used to prosecute uh, at least 11,600 asylum seekers. However, it cannot be inferred from the official statistics from these, for these offenses that they were definitely committed by refugees or asylum seekers because no government department in the United Kingdom collects data on criminal offenses, which indicates whether the offense was criminated, committed by an asylum seeker or someone else. It also does not collect data and report data on, on terms of the, um, the authority seeking to prosecute um, these, uh, these individuals. The CPS stated that it did not maintain data regarding how many of these prosecutions had been successful, how many had failed, or how many of these prosecutions had been withdrawn. Officials confirmed that they held data on 35,000 offenses of this type, which I requested information on which they say equates to 24,600 cases which they prosecuted. Holiday, who has done research under this issue and who has examined wrongful prosecutions of over 100 cases that were referred to the Criminal Cases Review Commission, has concluded that as a result of long-term and systematic practices of all state agencies, that the state has failed to engage with ex parte edimi. This is the high court case um, in the early 90s. Indeed, she forcefully argues that, quote, lawyers, immigration officials, police, the Crown Prosecution Service and the courts consider that refugees have no justification or excuse for what they do and that they cannot therefore bring themselves within the refugee and reasonable excuse defenses. To explore how this is occurring in the United case, in the United Kingdom, I explored briefly two empirical cases. Two studies pro provide evidence regarding how disjointed the legal system which prosecutes asylum seekers actually operates. In 2014, I was involved as an expert witness in a case in which an asylum seeker was tried at Chelmsford Crown Court. This is in Essex in Southern England. The female asylum seeker was charged with possession of an identity document with improper intention. This is contrary to section four of the Identity Documents Act of 2010. The case is called Regine versus SM. SM is the uh, appellant's initials. The defendant was an Eritrean national who had resided for most of her life in Saudi Arabia until she was deported by Saudi Arabia to Eritrea in 2000, 2013 as part of the Saudi government's attempt to rid the country of migrant labor. She was not illegal in any sense. She was not a criminal in any sense. On arrival in Eritrea, she fled to Sudan and transited through different European countries, always traveling under the instructions from an agent until she arrived at Stansted Airport in Southern England, where she used a false Italian ID to enter the UK. She was arrested on entry. She was immediately charged with seeking to enter the UK with a false identity document and was detained and briefly interviewed by the UK border force before she was charged. She immediately stated that the ID she was traveling on was false and gave her true identity. Interviews with the border force officials were very, very brief. Her travel document was seized along with her airline ticket, her mobile phone and the SIM card from her phone. She did not apply for asylum on arrival, nor is it clear whether she was advised to make an asylum application, but her claim would have been very strong. In preliminary discussions, I, I attended the hearing in Chelmsford, right? So I actually went to the case. This is not based on a look at the papers. In preliminary discussions between the Crown Prosecution Service, the Women's Legal Council and the judge, her counsel invoked Article 31.1 of the Refugee Convention. There was considerable legal argument about the relevance of case law in the preliminary discussions, but the judge who was uh, overseeing the hearings decided that the jury would be instructed that Article 31.1 did not address the meaning of transiting. When the case was convened and the jury was brought in uh, for a criminal trial, the defendant was asked to plead and on the advice of her counsel, she pleaded guilty to illegal entry. The jury convicted her and she was sentenced to 18 months imprisonment. 
The case illustrates the way in which all legal actors, the border force, the police, the Crown Prosecution Service, the judiciary, the defense counsel, and the secretary of state for the home office, all who have a different role in these kinds of cases, but they all worked in lockstep to prosecute the defendant for a criminal defense, even though her asylum claim had not been determined. This is of course contrary to Article 31.1 and British legislation. In 2016, a man named Christie undertook research in Scotland where he found a very similar process in operation. The principal difference is that most refugees seeking to transit the UK do not stop over in Scotland. Nevertheless, Christie set out how the criminal justice system and the Home Office process this type of case. He noted that responsibility for meeting Scotland's obligations under, under Article 31.1 lies with the, Crown, with the Crown Office and the Procur Procurator Fiscal Office, which is the equivalent of the Crown Prosecution Service in England. Christie noted that the system for handling this type of offense is inconsistent. At airports or ports, the UK Border Force handles incidents. Outside airports, the police may proceed with investigation or they may hand over, hand over the case to the Border Force. Citing the work of Aliverti, Christie notes that while there are a plethora of criminal offenses relating to immigration, most are not enforced in part because they serve what she calls a symbolic function to placate media and public concern about the government's inability to control immigration. Alverdi had argued that when individuals are prosecuted, it is low level offenders, offenders who are targeted and given disproportionate sentences in trials, which she says, fail to meet the normative requirements of criminal law. Asylum seekers have, in this sense, become a paradigmatic example of crime due to their, to their supposed illegal entry into the UK and allegations about their involvement in crime and terrorism. Christie notes a lack of transparency in the way that decisions to prosecute a case are taken. In particular, the decision to act, the decision as to whether to proceed with a prosecution is negotiated between the police and the border force. With the police taking responsibility for prosecuting the case and verifying the document used by a refugee, while the Home Office deals with the asylum application. However, he says, the police are not interested in low level offenders and are unlikely to prosecute this type of case. In any event, the police are not aware of the responsibilities under Section 31.1. And it is not clear whether the border force takes its cons takes 31.1 into consideration either. Now we're talking about domestic legislation here, not just international law. Furthermore, defense solicitors were unaware of Section 31.1 of the defense, and it was unlikely that defendants were adequately apprised of their right to a defense, as in the case I cited in Chelmsford. In short, defendants were routinely being told to, to plead guilty at their trial. Just as important, the Crown Prosecution was not aware of, of the Section 31.1 defense, and it was not apparent at that time that the first tier tribunal in Scotland, which hears all of these cases, was aware of Section 31.1 either. Now, now Christie quotes one of his informants, and this is a very telling quote. The informant is a defense solicitor who stated, I would hope that they, immigration solicitors, would be more aware of, of a section 31 of defense, but things are still siloed. By that point, the immigration lawyer is probably just dealing with the asylum claim and the asylum process. This is the siloing of immigration law, criminal law. If you are talking about a very short-term custodial sentence or a fine, it probably doesn't impact that much on how you look at someone's asylum claim. It's something that happened, done. We're now looking at this, end of quote. So the emphasis here is that each of the different agencies involved don't cooperate, don't communicate with each other. Therefore, they're also not aware of their obligations under domestic law. What can we conclude? Since the mid 1990s, the UK has wrongly prosecuted and convicted, convicted thousands of asylum seekers. These convictions have continued regardless of case law and regardless of the creation of a refugee defense and of a reasonable excuse defense. Indeed, as subsequent case law demonstrates, the 2004 Act created additional offenses without at the same time establishing an effective defense. <clears throat> 
The situation has given rise to a, to a situation in which all legal actors and institutions in the criminal justice system, and in the UK's asylum system, as well as immigration lawyers, the tribunals and the courts of appeal are working in lockstep to prosecute and convict asylum seekers, regardless of the fact that asylum seekers have statutory rights of defense. How has this situation arisen and what has sustained it? The reason why asylum seekers are being wrongfully prosecuted was revealed by the Criminal Cases Review Commission, which documented how cuts in legal aid, the non-disclosure of case material by the Crown Prosecution Service, and the declining quality of legal, legal practice has contributed to wrongful convictions. What is also clear is that it is extremely difficult for wrongfully convicted asylum seekers, refugees, to appeal against a conviction, either to the criminal cases uh, directorate or directly to the court of appeal. Indeed, and regardless of the criminal case reviews, efforts to alert the Crown Prosecution Service, the police, the Home Office, and the courts of this situation, state institutions have continued to prosecute asylum seekers. Finally, Francis Weber, a, a criminal barrister, an immigration barrister, suggests that the taint of illegality with which politicians and media have besmirched asylum seekers over the past several decades has meant that officials, prosecutors, lawyers, and judges are no longer able to conceive of asylum seekers as innocent. Her, her views are reinforced by the UK government's hostile policy climate here, which has uh, demonized and criminalized migrants in recent years. Courts and legal actors take, have taken an unduly narrow approach to this type of case for two reasons. First, they have focused on individual asylum seekers and has ensured that part of the policy is that asylum seekers are, are required to enter the country illegally. Therefore, they're becoming as illegal entrants into the country. Furthermore, in light of the heightened uh, concern about the number of asylum seekers reaching the global north, states have increasingly adopted punitive measures to criminalize migrants and deter asylum seekers. Um, the legislation should be recognizing Article 31.1, but it is being interpreted in the UK very differently than it's interpreted in, Can interpreted in Canada or elsewhere. Here, Article 31.1 provides no protection for asylum seekers who have illegally entered the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, um, for that really interesting uh, overview of the development of, of the issue and also the disjuncture between different elements. Um, look forward to the questions that we'll get on this later. Um, so next I will introduce Joe Hines, who is an ESRC funded PhD candidate at the University of Exeter, exploring the legal geographies of immigration law. Using ethnographies of tribunal hearings and interviews with their key actors, she examines the impact of space and technology on access to justice in immigration bail hearings. She's also a research fellow in online courts at Public Law Project, where her work focuses on online courts and tribunals, digital justice, and related access to justice issues. And she will be presenting today um, on her work on conducting disembodied online ethnographies of disembodied legal processes, loitering with research intent in digital spaces. Um, so I'll pass over to you, Joe. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming along to this session. Um, and thanks very much to Susan for chairing. I'm just going to share my screen. Great. So my presentation um, focuses on the way my methodology um, to gather data for my PhD has changed since the pandemic um, and what this tells us about hearings in the UK's immigration and asylum tribunal. Um, so if you can bear with a focus on methodology, I hope my presentation um, can offer some reflections on immigration and asylum court processes um, and how they've changed recently. Great. So prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, my methodology focused on conducting in-person ethnographies of immigration bail hearings um, in the UK. Following um, Jeffrey 2020, this was a heavily embodied process. Um, so it was really reliant on organic in-person interactions, rapport building, um, waiting and atmosphere. In other words, a lot of loitering around um, with the intent to conduct research. Um, and as a result of a pandemic, both the hearings and my ethnographies of them uh, moved to a remote setting. 
Um, so they were conducted via video conferencing software, much like Zoom, um, like we're doing now, um, or telephone. Um, and instead of traveling to hearing centers and spending all day conducting an in-person ethnography um, of a number of bail hearings, um, I conducted these ethnographies via mobile phone um, or laptop at home. So this presented a number of challenges um, for a method that places such an emphasis on embodiment, ad hoc interaction and open endedness. Um, so a day at a hearing centre, observing hearings, loitering in corridors, having informal impromptu conversations with hearing participants, um, that became instead a series of discrete observations with limited interaction possible with hearing participants. Um, and as you can imagine, this fundamentally changed the nature um, of the ethnographic encounter. So first of all, really, it'd be wrong to say that there weren't any benefits um, to a shift to a remote setting. In many ways, it was actually a more convenient method. Uh, for example, it was often easier to introduce myself as a researcher, as there were clearly defined points where all parties were required to do so. So this also made it easier for me to identify hearing participants and their role that they were playing. Similarly, I was forced to share the same limited means of engaging with the hearing as all the participants. So this was in contrast with my in-person ethnographies, uh, where it was common for only the bail applicant, um, so the person applying for immigration bail, um, only they were often presented via video link into the hearing room where all other participants were. So taken together, these elements of a shift to online ethnographies produced a levelling effect um, and sometimes made my role as a researcher easier. Finally, in some ways, it was still possible uh, to loiter with research intent. Sometimes I was admitted to a hearing either before it began or in a break and would be able to observe scenarios that I would not have been able to um, if the ethnography had been in person. These moments, um, alongside often being able to see hearing participants' home lives uh, through their video backgrounds, offered a window into participants' lives um, that was inaccessible through in-person in hearings. However, um, despite these additional snapshots provided by video hearings, online ethnographies were generally much narrower um, than their in-person counterparts. So this presented a trade-off. It was a more convenient fieldwork process, um, but it was a much less rich ethnography. So the remaining part of my talk today will focus um, on the extent and the impact of this lack of richness uh, with a view to understanding how remoteness can affect ethnographies um, and as a result, court processes. So embodied legal geographies um, have received significant attention in recent years, countering what Jeffrey calls images of law as an abstract, disembodied and immutable enactment of authority. This is clearly an extremely important development. Um, however, as Gil et al highlights, as we embrace the importance of presence in law, um, we must not overlook the ways in which absences play a role in legal events. So I suggest here that there are four key uh, methodological challenges associated with online ethnographies. Um, and that by examining these challenges, um, we can help to shed light on the impact of absences in legal events, specifically in this case, um, in the Immigration and Asylum Tribunal in the UK. So first of all, there was an enforced narrowing of sensory engagement with a hearing. The hearings heard via video conferencing platforms, audio and video engagement was possible, um, but for those heard via the telephone, only audio engagement was possible. Crucially, even the sensory engagement that was possible in either circumstance um, was already prescribed for me um, because the cameras for which I viewed other participants were set at specific angles. Furthermore, participants were only able to speak when their microphone was unmuted, um, which was not always decided by the participants themselves. Sometimes clerks took a, a preemptive approach, you could call it, uh, to the issue of unwanted noise. Um, and turned off the microphones of all parties except the judge and the two representatives. So consequently, during breaks uh, or in periods where we were waiting, where I might feasibly um, have developed the ethnography by engaging in conversation with participants, um, I was unable to. Second, uh, there was a loss of informal ad hoc conversation. Um, the online ethnographies I conducted suffered from an absence of co-presence. Whereas with in-person ethnographies, ad hoc informal interactions before or after hearings form the major part of the ethnographic encounter, and um, these interactions around the edges of hearings uh, were not possible online. 
the ethnographies were shorter uh, and more discreet, taking only as long as the hearings took, rather than a day of a more fluid ethnographic research. Consequently, loitering around corridors and waiting areas of hearing centres, which was a key element of my court ethnographies, was rendered impossible by the fact that all parties were in separate locations and we only came together um, for the moment of the hearing itself. This lack of co-presence not only limited the scope um, and the depth of my ethnographic research, um, but at times made it impossible altogether. Um, so as an observer in a remote hearing, I was often unable to speak to the clerk throughout the day, um, as I would be able to in in-person ethnographies. And this led to confusion <laughs> on a number of occasions. For example, I was left in, in a virtual waiting room, not dialed into phone hearings, um, or just not informed um, about last minute time changes on multiple occasions. And essentially this was just because um, I couldn't sort of poke my head into a remote hearing room to check what was happening like I would be able to do if it was in person. Third, the remoteness of the ethnographic encounter and its stretched nature across digital and physical space generated a liminal hearing space. Consequently, the bodily absences in remote hearings also generated what Gillatal referred to as psychological absences. So managing a split screen limited my engagement with the hearings and meant that I was more easily distracted. Um, so you can see a little mock-up of what my screen would look like whilst conducting an online ethnography here. Um, apologies for the not very artistic rendering, but I think you get the picture. So also during the pandemic, when everyone's personal and professional lives had almost wholly shifted online, conducting an online ethnography didn't mark the fieldwork out as a distinct experience. Um, it clearly highlighted the obstacles that remote hearings need to overcome in order to maintain legal hearings as occupying what Roden calls a special place for law. Whereas for in-person ethnographies, I would block an entire day out to travel to the field site. For online ethnographies, I would simply open a new tab on my web browser and log in. And the distraction of incoming emails, for example, and juggling multiple simultaneous online tasks, which I'm sure we can all relate to, at times took me away from a moment of the ethnographic encounter. Fourth, and, and finally, um, limit, my limited visibility as a researcher uh, in online, online ethnographies not only had methodological implications, um, but ethical implications as well. In the first instance, uh, the process of seeking approval um, from hearing participants to observe their hearings changed when my ethnographies shifted online. The online ethnographies had the effect of making the process of gaining consent easier uh, and more formalised with certain participants, most notably judges and clerks, uh, but much more difficult with others, including applicants, legal representatives and interpreters. Having said that, um, there was still significant variation in how judges and clerks responded to my request to observe. Um, for example, one clerk requested photo ID, um, despite this be by being no, no means being a condition of access uh, to a public hearing. Um, and through this, we can see how a shift to remote hearings created new forms of improvised discretionary power. Secondly, there was a broader question um, of how visible to make myself within the limits, obviously, set by the tribunal and the technology. This was less of an issue in telephone hearings, um, as these were audio only anyway. Um, but for hearings held via video link like this, um, it was initially unclear where I, whether I should turn my camera on. Um, so initially I turned my camera on and my mic before the hearing um, to introduce myself and then turned it off for the hearing ex itself. And I hoped that by allowing financial condition supporters and applicants especially um, to see me and my background, that it would reassure them that I was a neutral presence uh, with nothing to hide and it felt less voyeuristic. However, over time, some clerks and judges began to be more prescriptive with their guidance on how I should join the hearings. So one judge said that I should observe silently and off camera. After this, I turned my microphone off um, and my camera off for the duration of the hearings, um, reflecting that other judges might feel the same. But whilst judges and clerks were able to make their views known to me, um, other hearing participants, including crucially the applicants themselves, uh, were not able to. So the role of a body in court hearings and the extent to which it was absent or present in a remote setting 
were central in all of the methodological challenges that I've described um, in conducting online ethnographies. So video hearings in particular occupy an unusual space uh, whereby the bodies of hearing participants are not present and crucially not co-present, um, but not entirely absent either. So unlike the ethnographies that Cosinets describes, the online ethnographies I conducted were of live encounters with participants who were visible to each other from the waist up um, and would interact dynamically in real time. So through body language and nonverbal communication, the body asserted itself a, um, a role for itself in online ethnographies, um, even whilst it was being marginalised by the medium through which the hearing and the ethnography were conducted. So remote court watching then perhaps challenges more traditional conceptions of online or digital ethnographies, um, or at least generates a different form of online ethnography. So it's online, um, yet it maintains some of the live dynam dynamism um, of in-person ethnographies, um, and it's disembodied, yet bodies still form part of the ethnographic encounter. So to quickly conclude then, Conducting ethnographies um, in the form of loitering with research intent certainly is possible um, in digital spaces. It requires a reflexive approach to the ethical questions it can create, um, additional communication with gatekeepers, especially clerks, and the patience and willingness um, to be flexible enough to adapt the method to different circumstances and different preferences of specific participants. This success of online ethnographies demonstrates the need, as Howlett suggests, to expand our conceptualization of the field uh, to a much wider continuum of spatio-temporal events and relations between people. Nevertheless, uh, there are significant challenges generated by the disembodied nature of online ethnographies, and it's vital to acknowledge online ethnographies as distinct from their in-person counterparts. More broadly, um, reflecting on the methodological challenges of conducting ethnographies online reveals both the pre prevalence and the impact of absences in these legal events. So it's important to recognise absences in hearings more generally, um, but it's especially crucial to acknowledge and understand the impact of absences in remote hearings, because absences are likely, likely to be even more prevalent in remote hearings, um, and can help us to understand how they differ from their in-person counterparts. So in shifting the conversation from presence to absence, as Lida suggests, it becomes easier to see what is lost when participants are not physically present at a hearing. As a result, we can reveal possible obstacles that other lay participants, particularly applicants and appellants, um, may need to overcome to participate in remote hearings. And this can assist in the development of any safeguards that need to be in place um, to ensure that remote immigration and asylum hearings are fair. Thanks so much for your time. Um, I'd really appreciate any comments or questions at the end. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Joe, um, for presenting your really interesting work and how it's changed and shifted moving to online spaces. It's really fascinating. Um, finally, our, our fourth presenter for today is Susanna Paul, who is a final year PhD candidate at the University of Glasgow. She's previously studied law and sociology, and her research involves a socio-legal study of hearings in the Immigration and Asylum Chamber of the First Tier Tribunal in the UK. She's also interested in a range of issues, including access to justice, emotions in legal spaces, and procedural justice. Um, she will be presenting today her work on cooperation and kindness in the immigration and asylum chamber. So over to you, Susanna. Thanks, Susan. Thank you very much. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about cooperation and kindness in the first year tribunal immigration and asylum chamber. So as a bit of a mouthful, so I'm just going to call it the immigration tribunal for short. So very briefly, just an outline of what I'm going to cover today. Firstly, I will briefly explain the research project that informed this presentation and my observations at the Immigration Tribunal in Glasgow. I will then track um, my sort of unearthing of cooperation and kindness in the tribunal before making a kind of tentative case for incorporating relational values, including cooperation and kindness into hearings. And in doing so, I'll draw on some examples from my observations and what I think the benefits could be 
So before I hit you with kindness and cooperation, I want to break us in a bit gently with something that is perhaps, unfortunately, a bit more familiar to immigration hearings. So conflict and specifically adversarial conflict. So to take you briefly back to the beginning of my research, uh, three years ago, I set out to consider adversarialism in the immigration tribunal. So the context of this is that in the UK, um, in the immigration tribunal, it's known to have a very strongly adversarial character. Um, it was described in 2020 by the senior president of the tribunals, Ernest Ryder, as having a peculiar, peculiarly adversarial character. So I set out to consider how adversarialism featured in the immigration tribunal. And I firstly tried to sort of pick apart what adversarialism actually was. So in doing so, I realized that there were sort of two main strands to adversarialism. So adversarialism was on one hand, a legal practice concept or a concept that related to the format of the hearings to con. So it included looking at the roles that the parties to the hearing played, the structure of the hearings, who spoke when and, what we, and the way in which their contribution was structured. On the other hand, there is the st stylistic side of adversarialism. And with this came kind of connotations of aggressiveness and competitiveness in approach. So I set out to look at these strands of adversarialism in the immigration hearings. And I set out to look for examples of these behaviors and also um, examples of behaviors that deviated from them. So while I was observing at the tribunal, I realized that hearings took on what was on the surface a fairly adversarial, familiar format. So during my observations, I observed both immigration bail hearings and asylum and human rights appeals. In asylum appeals in particular, the adversarial format was particularly noticeable. So there was organized turn taking by each party, there was examination and cross examination, and there was also a fairly kind of predictability in the scripts of the hearings. However, as I began to kind of analyze my data more closely, I noticed that there was some more texture to be found. So as I looked closer to the format of the hearings, I noticed that there are actually regular deviations from traditional adversarial form. At one end of the scale and a sort of slight deviation from adversarialism came in the form of the judge asking questions and seeking only brief responses from representatives. At the other end of the scale and a sort of bigger deviation from traditional adversarial form came judges who would think aloud in hearings and discuss with parties the legal questions that needed to be answered. So this sort of took the form of a legal discussion that went back and forth between the judge and the rep. This was most notable um, in cases where a party who was usually present to the hearings was absent. So for instance, um, when the Home Office was unrepresented or where the appellant did not have a, a representative. And this is interesting, this sort of relates to um, some of Joe's comments about um, absences and also the paper um, from Nick and Nicole on absences and the ways that these can shape the way that law is practiced. Back to adversarialism for a second. Um, I had begun to unpick the idea that hearings in the immigration tribunal were highly adversarial in form and began to look at the data that I had collected on the stylistic features of adversarialism. So in terms of the stylistic features of hearings, the aggressiveness and competitiveness, competitiveness were actually far less common in the work group than I anticipated. Overall, there was a fairly strong environment of cooperation, but many of the actions that I had been witnessing seemed to go beyond a sort of functional fo form of cooperation. And the idea of cooperation involving the work group simply working towards a shared goal. So within the work group, there was a certain ethic of care amongst the group and looking out for the needs of the members of the work group. And I believed that this was more aptly captured with the description of kindness. So I hummed and hawed over whether this term would be the right one to use. I started to wonder whether I could actually get people into trouble by suggesting that they were exhibiting kindness. 
it's something that seems to quite kind of flagrantly cut across this cool rational image of the role of administration and also legal oversight. So kindness might be viewed as something that is kind of sweet and nice but that doesn't have a place in the tribunal. And it was this idea that led me to this image of these heart-shaped sugar dusted waffles that you see before me, before, before you. Um, but the kindness that I witnessed related to small actions and care that were taken to try and make the lives of those who were inter interacting with the tribunal just slightly easier practically and emotionally. I then did what all good re researchers do and I started to frantically Google kindness to see if anyone else had found this and whether it might be okay to murmur this word. Maybe I could at least find a more formal word that my colleagues in the law school might buy into. And this was when I learned that Scotland had included kindness as a national performance indicator. Um, so these performance indicators provide a kind of common set of values and outcomes for public services in Scotland to try and work towards. And there was a large literature developing um, through a project that was run by the Carnegie Trust to consider kindness in Scotland. One of the reports um, was written by Julie Unwin in 2018, and she suggested that kindness, emotions and human relationships are something of a blind spot in public policy and that we need to recognise that public services are all about relationships and emotions. She suggested that we need to become a bit more bilingual in the two lexicons of public service, the rational and the relational. And I think some of these ideas could be applied to systems of justice too. So it is this relational lexicon that I want to open up. And while I have headlined the concepts of kindness and cooperation, there are other related kind of relational and pro-social concepts that I believe feed into this topic. I'm very conscious of the fact that there are quite fine distinctions between these concepts and also providing definitions is a kind of problematic task in itself. So bear with me if I fumble slightly as I'm trying to kind of operationalize this language. So I would first support my argument by suggesting that rather than being a sweet optional extra, there are relational factors that in fact form a kind of basic component of asylum and human rights cases that the tribunal so often hears. So compassion can be understood to in involve a sensitivity to others and a commitment to trying to alleviate it and prevent it. I suggest that the provisions of protection for refugees and the principle of non refoulement create a legally obligated compassion and that states bind themselves to show compassion in granting refugee status. So the task that the immigration tribunal is in many ways kind of fulfilling is about aiding the administration of a legally bound compassion. In doing so appropriately, I would suggest that there is a need for both the guidance of the rule of law and also an ethic of compassion. I suggest that in the immigration tribunal, like in many other administrative justice settings, it is real people's real lives that are being subjected to intense scrutiny at a hugely vulnerable time in their lives. So this to me creates the responsibility to treat applicants with care. I would also in making this argument situate it as being part of a sort of broader acknowledgement of the need of a more relational and humane turn in administrative justice. Um, I would at this stage note the work of Zach Richards who in 2019 suggested that we might think of there being already a turn in administrative justice um, in terms of incorporating a form of responsive legality um, which involves a kind of adaptive engagement with applicants and the valuation of both the rule of law and also an orientation towards an ethic of care. So in his work, Zach looked at the Refugee Review Tribunal of Australia. So this is all very well, but let's move on to some examples. I was confronted with co cooperation in the very first hearing that I observed. I should point out that no one in the hearing was aware of what I was researching at this stage. But this quote on the screen exemplifies a commitment to an ethos of cooperation within the work group of the tribunal. 
So the uh, conversation began with the Home Office presenting officer, or HOPO for short, saying that they believed that they were very lucky in the tribunal in Glasgow. They spoke of the fact that everyone worked well together and interestingly noted that having a human connection with colleagues and the work group was important in creating this. The HOPO also spoke of a desire to keep adversarial processes to where they should be. This que the question does arise of where they should be, but I took this to partly describe a desire to avoid an overtly adversarial conflict and to avoid some of the stylistic features of adversarialism. So the conversation concluded by the Hoppo suggesting that things might be different down south. So it might be interesting to hear about others' experiences in other parts of the UK and also further afield. There were other sets of examples of kindness that I saw quite regularly repeated within the work group. So clerks would often seek to ensure each day that the parties were accommodated and helped, um, helped out in any way that was feasible. For instance, by suggesting that hearings that involved elderly witnesses or witnesses with children should be heard first. There were some examples of good practice from Hoppos as well who appeared to take quite genuine care to treat the app appellants and their um, witnesses and their lives with respect. There wasn't on the whole a kind of dogmatic dispute everything approach that is often associated with the Home Office. There were some examples of this but that in general wasn't the theme. Um, and the Home Office presenting officers actually frequently reported that they did not dispute particular accounts of events or the credibility of particular witnesses. And this actually often earned praise from judges. So how might we go about baking cooperation and kindness into the processes? Well, here I would draw on the insights of the reports from the Carnegie Trust Project and also from some of my observations at the tribunal. So kindness can be encouraged, however, it and also cooperation in particular cannot be that easily legislated for or prescribed. So it may even sometimes be counterproductive to do so. It's more effective and arguably sustainable to try and create an environment in which these um, values can develop and be fostered. So this would require creating working conditions which would promote these values. So when I was observing in the tribunal, I noted that the main threats to cooperative encounters in the tribunal occurred when reps were operating under kind of quite considerable stress. Home office understaffing and the need to provide cover for colleagues were some of the main culprits for creating these stresses. So finally, what would the benefits be of creating an environment of cooperation and kindness and allowing these to take root? Well, I would suggest that the benefit of a more cooperative and kinder tribunal would be wide ranging. So there is a duty to cooperate with the tribunal in the tribunal procedure rules and cooperation is highly important for the effective functioning of tribunal hearings. I would suggest that this is only going to become increasingly relevant in the move towards the digital tribunal. So cooperation will be vital in that context for the ongoing and iterative interactions that will be increasingly taking place online um, before the hearing stage. In terms of procedural justice, kinder and more approachable methods of conducting hearings can bring more room for participation and its associated therapeutic benefits. It can create a less daunting hearing environment for um, appellants. Additionally, we're aware that it matters to users how a process makes them feel. This has been found in many studies and it was something I also found in my own research. Um, finally, in other sectors, kinder approaches have been found to have observable benefits that have reached beyond what is initially expected. So in the healthcare sector, for instance, Researchers in the US found the strength of a doctor-patient relationship was associated with a 34% increase in the likelihood of a patient adhering to their prescribed medications. So there may be positive effects beyond what we could even predict. So should we seek to bake kindness into the process of the immigration tribunal? This is a question that could and should spark some debate. And I'm gonna suggest that yes, but it wouldn't be a magic pill and there would be a need to guard against unintended consequences. But I would also suggest that we should not shy away in fear 
I'm going to share my references with you as well. Great, thank you so much, Susanna. That really interesting presentation and lots of food for thought, definitely. Nick, did you have anything you wanted to add at the end from the Asai Fair point of view? No, uh, just to say thanks to the speakers. Thank you to you as well, Susan, for chairing so, so well. It's been a fantastic panel, lots and lots to think about. And uh, yeah, we get to break just a few minutes early for lunch now. So enjoy the lunch break. Hopefully see you back for the session after lunch. <laughs>